Hello everyone. Well, we have half time. <laughs> good evening. It's so good to see you uh, tonight. Um, we know we have been praying for you along with your GLs and we've been praying for your safety during the storm. So here, uh, seeing you here tonight, we know is an answer to our prayers. And so we want to welcome you. We are really joyful to um, that you came and welcome our satellite group. And I have some uh, great news to you that we met with the pastor in the Lake Nona area and uh, it was a great meeting. And we want you to continue to pray because now he's taking it to the elders and we are now waiting to see if they will invite us to come and have another satellite group on that area. So would you continue praying for us on that? Um, this week, we have studied two uh, of Judah's kings, right? Completely different, one of the other, right? King Asa and King Abijah, wow, night and day. You know, but we also learned that God strengthens those who wholeheartedly seek him, depend on him. And this affirmation is that as you are studying God's word, you will be strengthened because as you know God, you will be strengthened. And God is strengthens you through your personal study and also when you are studying community. That is something about being all together that um, help us, encourage us. For that reason, we have planned fellowships. Your GL has fellowships, but we also have this uh, plan, this all class fellowships three or four, four times, four times during our study. And next week is our all class fellowship. So we would like you to make plans, pray that you'll schedule whatever it is, you'll be free. So you can come a little early. It's not too much early, it's, it's just half an hour. 6.15 to 6.45, we'll be meeting right here in the sanctuary. And we are going to be uh, just check, uh, sharing with each other what God is doing in our lives, how so far God is speaking to us. And you know, when you share, you encourage somebody else with your testimony. And when they share, they encourage you. And as we do this, we are strengthened. We are strengthened. So I hope you make the plans for next week. Also is starting next week is our mini study in, on Elijah. However, whoever you are inviting should start to do their lesson this week. Your group leader has the link to give it to you so you can send your friends. This is how it works. If you invite your friends and family and say, hey, come and try BSF. No commitment, just come for two weeks for this mini study on the prophet Elijah. And then if you wanna stay, you, you can just register to the class and stay. We're gonna be placed in a group and you're gonna love it. But if you feel like, you know, I cannot do this now or this is not for me, it's okay. So meanwhile, BSF headquarters has prepared a, um, a place where those who are coming to try the mini study, they can log in. They have questions, the notes, a podcast with the lecture, and uh, it's all there for them. It's beautifully placed there. It is bsfinternational.org slash try BSF slash Elijah slash. I know you're gonna need that in writing, it's okay. Your group leader is going to provide that for you. Well, I mentioned to you before that this class is blessed with the staff and God leads us and the staff leads this class. And I have introduced you a couple of these members already and today, tonight, I want to introduce you uh, to our substitute teaching leader, which we call STL, which I, I call super teaching leader, uh, Cheryl Moyer. Thank you. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> All right, I guess we're going to stand and sing. We're going to sing our hymn, we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into our lecture tonight. Better turn this off. <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing. Lift up your voice. 
Father, it is our desire tonight as we come here to participate in this lecture and then in community as we discuss our lessons to praise you. God, there is so much to be thankful for, and we praise you for your faithfulness tonight. We praise you that we are even able to come here to sit in this beautiful location, to have electricity, to have air conditioning. God, you are so good to us, and so many times we are so undeserving. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would come tonight, that it would teach us from your word, that you would speak to our hearts, and that as we listen and have the courage to apply your word, that we would be more like you in every way. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what causes us to want the treasures of heaven more than the treasures of this world. We thought about that this week, didn't we? As the thought of our homes being destroyed or being um, damaged. We try not to be too uh, temporal about things, but it does weigh on us. And it depends on whether we want temporary joy or we want lasting joy. Earthly treasures um, may be valuable here on earth, but their worth is lost. Um, when our time here is gone. That's just the reality of it. Eternal treasure though is invaluable because it dwells with God. And he, God has invited us to live with him forever. Our lesson this week and the contrast that we are going to see between Abijah and Asa reveal to us a stark difference between wholehearted devotion to God and half-hearted devotion to him. And John talks a lot about this abiding um, in his letters throughout the New Testament. In 15, 9 through 10, it says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. 
abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You see that word abide a lot. And this illustrates for us that abiding requires action on our part. And the Greek word for abide is meno, M-E-N-O. And it means, now bear with me, I'm always curious how a Greek word can have 15 different descriptions in our language, right? But the Greek word for abide in our way, our language is to stay, to remain, to be true, to persevere, to keep walking beside, to get in close, to dwell, to be near, to not perish, to withstand. It means not to wander away, to stay engaged, and to endure. It means to stay wholeheartedly devoted to God and not yield to the things of this world. So why is it that wholehearted devotion is so important? Well, we saw in our lesson this week, didn't we? Abijah had very little devotion except for the one instance that we read about. And Asa, even though he was a man um, that followed God, he couldn't stand for things to be hard. So he chose um, in his moment of weakness, the shortcut of protection from outside sources rather than the powerful lasting protection of God. The narrow road though of becoming wholeheartedly devoted to God in our daily walk is the call to do hard things but to do them with self-control, training ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit to submit to God, body and soul. The hard thing you and I are called to do is to turn our affections from our self and our self-reliance to wholehearted devotion to God. The running to Christ, the wholehearted devotion to him and him alone, that is what keeps us from running to sin. So wholehearted devotion uh, is active. It is a choice, a deliberate pursuit, but it's also one that's costly. Wholehearted devotion is loving Jesus above everything else we find um, so that we find no other place to be than where he is. That's where we find joy. That's where we find peace. That's where we find our protection. And so my goal for us tonight is to leave here knowing that God calls us as believers to wholehearted devotion to him. Not just these kings here in our passage tonight or the biblical prophets that we read about or your pastors or even the spiritual leaders we see on TV, but you and me, he calls us to wholehearted devotion. Our husbands, our children, our families, all believers, all those who profess him as Savior are called to wholehearted devotion. The reality is our experiences personally parallel Israel's, don't they, in so many ways. They were chosen by God to represent him to the world, but they often forgot the truth of their calling. And we see that they stumbled blindly, didn't they, after idols. But don't we do that too? Oh, our idols are different. They're often not even visible to the eye, but they are every bit a stumbling block um, to, whole, to wholehearted, true devotion. Um, every bit as much a stumbling block as those big golden calves that we read about. Things like wealth and prestige, self-fulfillment uh, self are all idols of our day. And God sent prophets and priests then to warn his people of coming judgment if they didn't return to him. And our passage tonight does the same for us. It's a warning and a contrast between wholehearted devotion to God and half-hearted devotion to him. Aren't you thankful that God's word teaches us and warns us and directs us how to live this life of wholehearted devotion that God has called us to? You see, if we put anything in God's place, we worship it. Despite what we profess with our lips, we worship it. A proper view of God, therefore, gives us a perspective to everything we face. So 
as we go to his word tonight, let's seek him and his perspective as we look at what he has for us in Kings and Chronicles. So as you did your lesson, did you notice that the book of Kings and Chronicles seem very similar, but very different, right? Why did God choose to preserve both books when they seem to say much of the same thing? I asked that this week. My husband said the same thing. The answer is found, though, in the theological purpose um, for each of the books. You see, the, the, the kings are straightforward history. Uh, it seems to make a very simple point, which is basic Old Testament theology. Obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings curse. That's the principle that's found in the Mosaic covenants that we see in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So the book of Kings is an appraisal of each king. They either did good in the eyes of the Lord or they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We don't get much more. Chronicles, though, has a different context and a different theological purpose. Um, the target audience there is the people who have returned to the land after their exile. We're going to read about them down the road. They're under Persian control, and they face a country devastated by the Babylonians, and the temple is in shambles. And many of their houses and, and structures in Jerusalem are in ruins. And as they return to their land and engage in various types of building project, uh, projects, which we're going to see in Ezra and Nehemiah, they experience opposition. And that results in several setbacks. And they're discouraged. They're defeated. And they're growing in despondency. And so God sent prophets like Haggai and Zechariah and leaders like Ezra and Nehemiah to encourage them to stay faithful um, and to remain steadfast in, pur and, um, in purpose. Um, but even so, we see that they continue to struggle. These people need to be reminded of Israel's history, of Israel's kingdom and God's faithfulness to them. But they needed the history to be written in a way that would encourage them in their current circumstances, specifically their struggle in completing the temple. So the book the books of Chronicles are written with this audience in mind. And so the theological focus of this particular history of Israel's kingdom is specifically the role that worship of the Lord played in the outpouring of the Lord's blessing. We saw that this, this week, right? When his favor was with them. Wherever the king, whenever the king led the people into proper worship of the Lord, the eyes, with eyes on God, the people we saw prospered. As these people would read this in history in the book of Chronicles, they would be encouraged to respond similarly and kind of get their act together. They would sense an urgency to rebuild um, the temple so that proper worship could be restored and so the Lord could uh, assume his proper place in their community. And so the purpose of this history was really to ignite a passion to worship to worship the Lord and his holiness. And I hope that as you read and studied and answered your question this week, questions this week, that it did that for you. It ignited the same passion in you. Well, 1 Kings 15 summarizes King Abijah's life as it normally does and it tells us basics, right? He committed all the sins that his father did and that his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. But in uh, verse six, it tells us briefly a little more, doesn't it? There was a war between Abijah and Jeroboam, but it doesn't give us any details. So we go over to Second Chronicles for the details because I believe God wants to make a point. And it includes one of the many battles between the two kings. And so that's where we're going to spend most of our time tonight in 2 Chronicles. So let's turn our Bibles to 2 Chronicles 13 and we'll start there. So why do you think God chose to highlight the little good that Abijah did when our king's passage clearly tells us that he was as sinful as his father? Do you find that interesting? Why does it not record all his failures and highlight instead his military triumph? Well, I think it's because it highlights God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness to his covenant promise with David, even despite Abijah's sinfulness. 
And that is the great hope and enduring promise for us today. Even today, in the year 2022, even after Hurricane Ivan. So Abijah pulls together his 400,000 warriors and he goes to battle um, against the 800,000 men that the Northern Kingdom had under Jeroboam. And right off the bat, he doesn't seem like a very bright tool in the shed, right? To go up against an army that has um, almost double the amount of fighting men that he has, but hey, God didn't describe him as the smartest man either. So we have to remember that. Nevertheless, um, he's poised with his armies and he begins this speech that claims the illegitimacy of Jeroboam's kingship, blaming him for the division of the kingdom, reminding him of the covenant that God had made with David regarding the kingship of Israel and its lineage. And then Abijah repeated all the religious mistakes that Jeroboam had made. The golden calves, the use of illegitimate priests, the ones that he had instituted, the list was long and it was very offensive. And he contrasted their idol worship with the fact that Judah had not abandoned God's design for their worship of him. And then finally, he pleaded with Israel not to fight, the, not to fight because the Lord was going to give them the victory against Abijah's um, smaller army. Instead of being convicted, though, by the words of Abijah and acknowledging his sinful ways, Jeroboam is just devising a plan um, to ambush Abijah and by sneaking around behind him where they set up and pinning him in from the front and the back, I might say a very seemingly effective plan, but God, right? In this desperate moment though, we see that the people of Judah cried out to God and we saw that it was a game changer, right? Scripture tells us that the trumpets were blown and warriors sounded the battle cry and their cry, I love this, their cry for help reached heaven and God's power was released on their behalf. Have you ever felt like you're in a situation where you're sounding the trumpet and raising the battle cry to heaven and you're expecting God to hear your cry? They lifted their eyes to the Lord and they put their trust in him, even though the odds were clearly, clearly against them. What is the 400,000 man deficit um, when God is on our side, right? What is Hurricane Ian when God is on our side? In spite, though, of the clever military maneuver, Jeroboam's vastly superior forces were defeated because the army of Judah relied on the Lord, the God, their God, and their father. Jeroboam suffered, we see, a loss of over 500,000 men. That's over half. And the account is told to make a very important point. When God's people look to him and depend on him, the battle belongs to the Lord. When they keep their eyes on the Lord and trust his gracious sovereign care, they don't need a strong, numerous army, do they? Because God is faithful. He keeps his promises, his, um, his, uh, he keeps his promises and his word and his word will stand firm and true forever. So whatever we face in life, God knows exactly what we need to persevere, and he fights for us in our greatest need. Have you ever felt pinned in on both sides or on all sides? Maybe you've just sheltered yourself under the wrong source of refuge. Wholehearted devotion to God requires our constant dependence on him. That's our principle for this uh, section about King Abijah. Wholehearted devotion to God requires constant dependence on him. God's promises are firm, though, even though we are oftentimes unreliable. Even in Abijah's lack of devotion, God kept his promise of a king on the throne of David because God's promises are certain. And our failures, here's the encouraging part, 
Our failures don't alter the faithfulness and the mercy of God. Do you seek and trust God's direction or his direct intervention to provide emotional, spiritual, and physical strength, the strength that you need to fight the battle you face? Maybe even the battle that you fight, uh, face today. God showered grace on Judah. Despite much that remained unpleasing about him within the kingdom, but that, that is the beauty of God's grace and God's commitment to be faithful to his promises. What characterizes your life? What would it be like to have the words of 1 Kings 15, 3 recorded about you for all of eternity? He committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God. We see Abijah's shining moment, don't we, of devotion to God in his ways. But ultimately, this part of scripture about, is about God's faithfulness and not Abijah. Um, it's about his faithfulness to Abijah and not the other way around. Inevitably, circumstances are going to test the depth of our faith. And scripture tells us that despite this momentary display of faith, Abijah lived a life of failure towards God and towards God's standards. God is worthy of our wholehearted devotion because he's merciful and because he's faithful, among many things. And that's a truth about God that has never changed and it never will. And we're made to be tethered to God's truth, not our own, not the world's truth. Deliberate dependence on the character of God's person and power gives us hope in the midst of the challenges that we face. I hope you see that this week in this passage. Well, we've read about King Abijah, whose faith was considered not fully devoted to God. And now we turn to King Asa, who scripture tells us did right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. So let's see now what a heart fully devoted looks like and what a heart fully devoted to God acts like, because they do go hand in hand. Our account of King Asa's reign in 2 Chronicles includes important details of the proper worship of the Lord. The writer um, of, of Chronicles here in 14 focuses on the fact that King Asa commands commanded the people to seek the Lord and obey the commands of the Mosaic covenant. This is the kind of leadership that leads to the blessing of the Lord. And we see that the Lord does bless them, doesn't he? They begin a number of building projects because while they're at rest, um, we see in 14.7, it tells us that they could do this in building and prospering of their nation. Um, because they have sought the Lord and the Lord has given them rest on every side from their enemies. We see that even the army of Judah has grown, hasn't it? He now has 580,000 combined fighting men and they're experiencing peace and rest. But enter Zara the Cushite, right? There's always a plot twist, especially in the Old Testament. Cush, the area that they're from, is in modern day Egypt. And the battle was near Merishah in the southwest point of Judah. And we see, again, a very similar story develop, don't we? Judah is vastly outnumbered, right? The Cushites are said to have upwards of about a one million man army. And they also have 300 chariots. I had not read about chariots before, so I wonder if they had even seen those uh, before. But Judah has been here before, haven't they? with the odds stacked against them. And if we look at this with our human eyes, our first thought is that they should just give up, right? And recognize that he has no chance against this massive army, but he doesn't, does he? He does what any good king would do and he cries out to the Lord and puts his faith and trust fully in him. And what happens next is familiar to those who know the Lord and depend on him. The Cushites are annihilated. And they lose a lot of fighters, don't they? And they can't recover from that. Not only did God give them victory, we see that they got a lot of good stuff along the way too, didn't they? 
Um, the point the writer of Chronicles is making is that when the nation worships the Lord properly and puts their trust in him, they prosper. That means no matter how strong the opposition, they experience victory. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. So moving into chapter 15, we see that the men are returning from this uh, incredible victory and God in his love and his mercy sends the prophet um, Azariah with a word of warning. You know, this is the only place that Azariah is mentioned. And so God used him to give a very special promise and a warning um, to the king and his army. A good warning after such a resounding success, because we know what successes can do to our, um, our building up of ourselves, right? Our ego, that's right. Thank you, Michelle. Um, this message is simple. He says, seek the Lord and he will be found. He's the one who gives the victory, and he's the one who gives you peace and rest. And despite the uh, reaction we see later in chapter 16, we're going to get there. Here, the warning of the prophet gives Asa what? Gives him great courage, doesn't it? And we see in 15.8 that the courage propels him um, to make even more reforms. The result, we see that idols are torn down and the proper worship is restored. And the excitement is just so overwhelming and electric that verse 9 tells us that even some of the people from the northern kingdom, um, Israel, had come down and joined in when they saw that the Lord was with, with them. That's what wholehearted devotion to God does. It puts words into actions as an, and is an example for others. Most notable, though, is what happens in verse 10 to 12. They renewed their covenant with the Lord to seek him with all their hearts and soul. It says that they took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and horns. And verse 15 says that all of Judah, all of Judah rejoiced about the oath because all of them had sworn it wholeheartedly. They had sought God eagerly and he was found by them. Can you even imagine what this nation would look like, our nation, if we had a revival like this. Asa was on a roll here too. He even deposed his grandmother from her position as queen because of her idol worship. Can you even imagine Granny getting tossed out of the palace? <laughs> Bold, courageous, wholehearted devotion, right? To toss out Granny. And the blessing, we see the nation is blessed with peace, and rest, and they seek God wholeheartedly, even in their time of peace. So how are you establishing um, habits of seeking God in your times of rest and in your seasons of peace? When we do that, when we seek him, even when things are good, then crying out to him in times of difficulty becomes just a natural response for us. Because we know that true rest comes when we rest in him. So finally, what happens in the next chapter, 16, serves as a contrast, doesn't it, to this beautiful moment of worship that we just read about in 15. And although Asa's lengthy rule was characterized by devotion to the Lord and the eradication of idolatry of those that had come before him, that's not the whole story, is it? As King Asa moves towards the end of his life, he's at war with King Basha of Israel. And for some crazy, foolish reason, he looks to the king of Aram for help instead of doing what he's always done and trusting the Lord. Now, I want to caution us before we go getting all super spiritual and shaking our heads about this foolish move. Um, we often find ourselves in that very same place, don't we? all too often, forgetting God's goodness and faithfulness to us, or even worse, thinking that we got this, or look for human solutions to our needs and problems instead of relying on God. Asa, like every other human king, was not perfect. While his heart was fully committed to the Lord, and we know that despite this relapse here, because scripture tells us that, we see that his actions did not always follow suit. But aren't we like that too? 
Sadly, Asa found himself in a panic, right? King Basha had fortified the border city of Ramah, which was just a few miles north of Jerusalem, and it was preventing people from traveling into the southern, uh, into the, um, between the kingdoms of Judah from the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom to Judah. And it seems that Basha had reclaimed some of the cities that um, Abijah, I'm sorry, yeah, Basha had re, um, reclaimed some of the cities that um, uh, Abijah had taken, and then he had taken them back. And Asa sees, uh, seeks an alliance with the king of Aram, and he asks him to invade the northern kingdom so he can distract King Basha from his aggressions against them in the southern kingdom. And scripture tells us he paid for the protection with the treasures from the temple. Hmm. Well, it seems like the treaty worked, right? Because Ben-Hadad conquered the towns in question, and <laughs> King Basha, we see, uh, of Israel retreated. But enter prophet Hanan, right? God sends Hanani with a simple question. He says, why trust in Aaron after the great victory God gave you over an even stronger army of the Cushites? I mean, they were a million almost. Why put their trust, why do you put your trust in them now? Didn't you hope to see King Asa repent and cry out for forgiveness at the rebuke of the prophet Hanani? But instead, he did the exact opposite, didn't he? He threw him in prison. And instead of repenting and humbling himself before God, um, he, before the God he had trusted, um, and been devoted to for so many years, he pushed back, didn't he? It was prophesied that he would have many years of um, his reign. Uh, it was prophesied that he had many years of war and the rest of his days would not experience peace that they had enjoyed when they did seek the Lord. God also gave Asa a constant reminder of his stubborn, rebellious heart by afflicting him with that disease in his feet, didn't he? Yet in all of scripture, it does not tell us that Asa turned to the Lord. Probably the saddest verse in, in this chapter or of our night um, is verse 12. It says, though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. Even some of the best of God's servants can end up in a bad way. And we're prompted to ask ourselves, the question, do we understand that rest comes from the Lord only as we yield to his promises and his sovereign purposes, only as we keep our eyes fixed on him, trusting him fully in all things? This passage serves as a warning to us today, even as it did the people that were returning from exile. King Asa had a lot going for him. He knew the blessing of following the Lord, and he enjoyed the prosperity of those blessings, but he grew cold. He grew complacent. Instead of responding in repentance, he responded with anger and imprisonment and oppression. May God stir in us a deepened desire for obedience as we study this passage so that we can learn from Asa. So what's our takeaway from this account of King Asa's life? God strengthens us to trust him when we wholeheartedly depend on him. That's our principle. God strengthens us to trust him when we wholeheartedly depend on him. Second Chronicles 16.9 is a beautiful verse. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Does that characterize your life tonight? What would our lives look like if we sought the Lord wholeheartedly? Better yet, what's holding us back? What if you asked him to encourage your heart so you could be devoted to him wholeheartedly? God is worthy of our complete devotion because of who he is and what he has done. And in spite of our of failure near the end of his life, God counted Asa as wholly devoted to him all the days of his life. And as believers, we cannot let our guard down and become complacent with sin as we see Asa did. We need to be responsive when God sends warnings, when he convicts us of sin and he calls us to repent. And aren't you glad that God's faithfulness and mercy don't depend on our faithfulness? 
and that he rewards faith, however small and however intermittent. God is merciful, even when people like you and I fail. He's faithful, and he offers people an opportunity to turn from their sin. He's gracious to sinners. That's the beauty of saving faith. Yes, God disciplines us when we sin, but always, always with a desire to soften our hearts and bring us to repentance so we can worship him and be fully and wholeheartedly devoted to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this warning, this conviction, this call in my life and hopefully in the women sitting here tonight to do whatever it takes to make whatever sacrifice you call us to make to be wholeheartedly devoted to you. God, give us the strength to do that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.